morning God said, I'm ready to prepare, Lord. Their heart's a new God. Ready to take in this worship, Lord. Your word, your grace, your love, your peace, God. Now we're able to do it in the building, Lord. They see God, walls, the chairs. What a blessing, Lord. We thank you for that, God. within us, Lord. It's time that we devote to you, God, to sing your praises, Lord, to rejoice and to lift you up, God. We just pray, God, that you would just stir, Lord. That your spirit would fall upon us, God, that it would be fresh in your Lord. That we'd be refreshed, Lord. And that your word, God, that it touch our hearts, Lord. That it speak to us, God,
hope the Lord to see you. Yes, our hearts, Lord. Father, to truly accept you into our hearts, Father. That's my prayer today, Father, that anybody's in doubt who's listening to me right now, Father, praying to you, in doubt, in heart, in fear, in have worries, Lord, that they just that they accept you in their heart, God, and they just fully give all those things out to you. Lay it out your feet, Lord. That there's no burden big enough, God, that we can give to you, Lord, that you handle. If it's uh, pain, if it's health, whatever it is, Father, I just pray, Lord, that we just realize that we can't hold it in and try to figure it out on our own. We have to rely on, rely on you, Lord, Lord. That's my prayer again, Lord. We pray, Father, that uh, you just bless us abundantly today, God, as we are about to listen to Pastor Rivers' message you've given him, Lord. Yes, Lord. Allow us to really sink into it, Lord. Help your spirit just help us understand, Lord. What is it that you want us to hear yes, today? Yes, God. Help us change and become better for you. Yes. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 Good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Good morning, everyone out in the courtyard. We're glad you're here this morning. We want to take our seats, and if you have a bulletin, open it up, and we will get into the bulletin. Just a few announcements and some clarifications before we get started in the Word today. And today we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we'll look at verses 12 through 20, just in case you want to get there while I'm announcing a few things. This coming Monday, guys, is our uh, men's retreat meeting. So those that are helping out with the whole planning of it, uh, remember it's at 6.30 p.m. If you don't have a bulletin, raise your hand and they'll get you one. Also, uh, back by popular demand. <laughs> We have a discipleship meeting. We missed uh, last month, uh, April, or May, May, June, yeah, May, but it's back, so we'll be meeting this coming Tuesday, July 2nd at 6.30 here at the church. So those of you that were involved with the discipleship class, uh, let, let each other know, and those that are interested, come on out at 6.30 here at the church, and we just uh, talk about ministry, about Christianity, and where it's at, and, and answer questions. So. It's an opportunity to just sit with me at the table, have a cup of coffee, and just discuss Christianity and, mm -hmm. and um, see what the Spirit does as we just kind of connect and get to know one another. So that's 6.30 this coming Tuesday. Yes. All are invited. Our 4th of July barbecue is this coming Thursday at 4 p.m. here. So the question was asked, is Virginia going to have a sign-up sheet? And the answer is no. Because all you need to do is bring yourself a main dish, a favorite dessert, and a liter bottle of soda. That's it. So you can bring some chicken. You can bring corn on the cob. You can bring potato salad. You can bring potato chips, uh, 
spare uh, barbecue ribs if you want to, which we will have a barbecue set up here. Many will set it up. If you'd like to cook those ribs here, that's fine. Are you uh, coming? Am I coming? Yeah. What? Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so yep, I'm bringing my, my famous <laughs> recipe. It's Appetite. called KFC. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long time for me to make it, but it's good. <laughs> so that's this coming Thursday here at the church. It's at the church, by the way. Here's the confusion. Someone thought that uh, it was at my house. It's not at my house. It's here at the church. The baptism's at, at my house. So unfortunately, we won't have a pool here, but we'll have a nice cool area in this time of fellowship. And this is for those that don't have anywhere to go and you know are alone at home and so forth. If you have family, then by all means go visit your family. Or if you have tickets for some, you know, fireworks show, then go enjoy yourself. But this is for those that um, just want to fellowship with believers. Our annual baptism is July seventh, which is coming up what a week from today. So excited. Yeah, it looks like we have about 90 people showing up. Oh, yeah. wow. We have a, a, a crowded house that day, a lot of swimming, a lot of uh, volleyball, and, and a neat time of fellowship. But then we're going to have about 8 to 10 people baptized. So neat. Praise God. The taco man will be there. So uh, come hungry and enjoy the food that's there. All we ask is that you bring a towel, a chair. If you want to sit in a lounge chair on the grass or whatever, we will have chairs and tables there. But also a one liter bottle of your favorite soda so that we can share that with everyone else. All right? Let's have the ushers come forward. And as they're doing that, I want to uh, challenge you this morning. I don't have a, a little card made up or anything, so this is up to you maybe later on today or if you have a piece of paper that you take notes with. But I want to challenge the church today, and those of you outside in the courtyard also, is I want you to write down three names of three individuals that you know and you have some sort of relationship with them. Uh, they don't come to church, and they may not be Christians, but I want you to write their name down, put their names in your Bible, and I want you to start praying for them, that God would minister to them, that God would save them. That God would use you or whatever other means to draw them to himself. So I want to just start that, challenge us to pray for those three people, and then watch what God does. Does that mean they're all going to get saved? Oh, that would be so wonderful if that Amen. was true. It would be great. But the odds are and chances because of the enemy and what's in the world and so forth that they might not. But maybe one of those three, maybe two. Let's pray that they all do. Let's have faith that God can change them. So I want to challenge you for the rest of the year, just keep those people in prayer and take the opportunity when the Lord really nudges at your heart to just say, hey, why don't you come to church with us? So we have an event. Why don't you come out and join us? And then we'll see what the God does. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's, let's pray. Oh, gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to gather together in your holy name. Thank you, Lord, for the remnant of the church, Lord. And the word remnant means the few that are still committed mm -hmm. and still willing, Lord, to yeah. participate in the function of the church, the assembling of one another, as Paul says in Hebrews 10, uh, 24 through 5, 6, Lord. I thank you for them, Lord, and I pray you strengthen them, encourage them, Father, and not lose heart, Father. And I pray for those, Lord, who don't come to church, that are Christians, yes. that yes. sit home and watch, Lord. I pray you convict their hearts, yes. Lord. That they should be in church, Father. Amen. They should be here because you commanded us to assemble one with another. Yes, First of all and foremost, Lord, it's a yes, command. Lord. And we don't follow commands because they save us. We follow commands because we're obedient to our Savior. Yes. And we love Him. Yes. And Lord, secondly, to fulfill the calling that you have in each one of our lives. You have gifted us with gifts. And we need to use those gifts for the body of Christ. Ephesians uh, chapter 5 and 6 are very clear on that, Lord. And so I pray, Lord, that you would convict your people, Lord, in their hearts that they should be in church mm -hmm. yeah. and not watching from some screen. Mm -hmm. Lord yeah. God, touch yes. them, Lord. We pray, Lord, for the message today yeah. and for the offerings, Father, yeah. that you would bless them and bless the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
All right, let's open up our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Well, we're almost halfway through in the chapters, but it's been a, a good ride so far, I think. I've been really enjoying it. And we will be looking at verses 12 uh, through 20. My Bible says, warning against sexual immorality. Wow, that's a hot topic today. Mm. Yes. Boy, are we living in the days of Sodom and Gomorrah? Mm. We really are. So my theme today is what defiles the temple? What defiles the temple? And I'm not talking about the church building, nor in Israel, Jerusalem, where the temple should be built, but there is no temple. But I'm talking about the temple, which is our body. Yes. Our body. What defiles the Christian body would be another way of saying that. The temple is describing the very heart of the believer. And I'll tell you what, there is a battle for your heart. There's a battle for your heart. And that battle is being fought in the spiritual realm. God is on one side, the enemy is on the other, and they both want your heart. Mm. And you have the choice to give your heart to one or you give your heart to the other. That's your choice. That's free will. So either you give your heart to the Lord or you give your heart to the enemy. And it's so easy to give your heart to the enemy because he makes it easy. And it is a battle to give your heart to the Lord because it's not normal for us to think less of ourselves. To be less selfish. It's easier just to be selfish. And not think of others more highly than ourselves. Mm -hmm. I was reading the Daily Bread, and as I read this little story, and you know the Daily Bread is always filled with some beautiful analogies and stories, and it really gets you right there at the point of what they're trying to say. And I, I read this little story, and I want to read it to you because I think it makes sense. It reads, as a young homemaker, I enjoy cleaning our house from top to bottom. Uh, that's unusual. <laughs> Who likes cleaning their house from top to bottom, right? But she goes on. The trouble was it never stayed clean for long. Yeah. Eventually I discovered that if I kept our house reasonably tidy, it appeared to be clean even when it wasn't. Gradually I concentrated more on the appearance of a clean house and neglected a thorough cleaning. This compromise was not only convenient, it was convincing. Sometimes even I was fooled until one sunny day when my clean looking house was revealed for what it was, dusty and dirty. Mm. Light does that sometimes, right? You can have a, a house dimmed all day long, but as soon as you open up the windows and you know those, those shutters or curtains and the light comes in, you realize, whoa, what a mess my house truly is. <laughs> <clears throat> she goes on. In Jesus' day, the scribes and the Pharisees were hypocrites who concentrated on the appearance of holiness while neglecting heart holiness. You get that picture? Mm -hmm. Just superficial. Nothing really felt deep in the heart. And when the light of Jesus shone on them, he revealed the truth about their outward religious life. Because their hearts were evil and wicked. They wanted to kill Jesus because he was the light of the world which revealed their wickedness. They couldn't stand the light. And really, he revealed the religious system that they lived and based their life upon and not a heart-changing attitude towards God. He didn't say these external acts were necessarily wrong, but they were wrongfully used as a cover-up for wickedness. For them, inner house cleaning was long overdue. Keeping up appearances in our housework isn't serious, but pretending our hearts are clean is. Mm. That's why God tells us in 1 John 1, 9, that if we sin and we confess those sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us. You, we Jesus. need to take it seriously. Mm -hmm. And I think the church isn't serious anymore. We've, we've lost the seriousness of church. Amen. You know, we've lost the seriousness of church. We really, we really have. Uh, going to church is not serious anymore. I can get that next team, next week. Uh, reading the Bible is not as serious. I've got too much other things. Uh, 
it's not serious. We don't take it serious. It, it, it's kind of like guys, and it seems like guys do this more than, than women do, but they get sick and they don't want to go to doctors uh, because they don't take it serious. They hate doctors. They don't want to hear the bad news, and so why go? Let's just stay home. And so they end up dying. And a friend that went through that just didn't want to go, and eventually his stomach cancer grew, and he ended up passing away because he didn't take it serious. And, and we're like that in the church today. The things that build our relationship with Jesus are not taken seriously. Only those who are clean on the inside will welcome Jesus with confidence when he returns. So, this morning's context, so that we get the context here, and I want you to understand this very clearly. In both 1 Corinthians chapter 5, which was dealing with sexual immorality in the church, right? Pertaining to a specific member who was sleeping with his stepmother. That, that's pretty radical, but it's happening today. Nothing's changed. It's probably worse, and we see it worse today. And in chapter 6 here, in this section, we see certain sinners who are described in their sexual immorality. And he described them, uh, we described them last week when we met, and he's going to describe them even more today. Paul has brought up these issues of sexual conduct of the Christians for a reason. He'll address some of the questions and problems of Corinthians Christians had in regards to understanding and doing what God wanted them to do in regards to immorality, their sex life. There are a lot of things which a believer can do, but they are not expedient or profitable for them to do. Uh, and Paul's going to mention at least one of them, and one of them is eating. We have the liberty of doing that. But in the sense of sexual immorality, we don't have that liberality to do so. Now, let me just bring you up to date. What is happening in our world today? We see this revolution. We thought the hippie movement brought in the, the love children and sexual immorality. That may have been the start, but it has progressed to debauchery, to a great amount of immorality. There's a great movement of a small amount, and they say less than 4%, some say 6 8% of the United States, which is what, over a little over 300 million people? So you're talking a very small amount that are pushing this gay, lesbian, transgender agenda on the rest of the world. This is what's happening. And the Democrats and some Republicans have helped move that movement forward because they're looking at this not as sin, not as an illness, but as a right to a human character. They were born in this manner. Now, this is what's going on. It's getting like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah, isn't it? Yes. When the whole city was corrupt and evil, and the only people that were reasonable were Lot and his family. Mm -hmm. And the whole city came to Lot and his family to do what? To know them. In other words, have sexual relationships with them from men to women. That's how bad it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's getting that way today. I recently saw a picture on Facebook where there was a gay parade. parade and there were adults, but there were also children. And they're dressed with all these costumes. And the children were also dressed that way, parading themselves in this gay pride. Parade. Now, you're going to notice this, and you probably already have, and you haven't said much about it, just like I haven't, but I'm going to say it. Facebook is getting just as bad as YouTube. Amen. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, if you go on to Facebook, so you'll all of a sudden see sexual acts taking place. And this is what your kids are watching while well, you're not monitoring them, by the way. Facebook no longer has that ability to just monitor everything. So this stuff is happening on Facebook, which is now molding and shaping your kid's idea of what sexual AOD is all about. There's a push right now. It is ACR, I believe. Don't quote me on that part, 99. But it's just a legislation that's just come out. We're going to see more of it as we get closer to voting. But it is pushing for the acceptance of this lifestyle. Mm -mm. The legislation says this, that everyone needs to accept this lifestyle. Mm -mm. Whether they're lesbian, whether they're gay, whether they're transgender, whether they're bisexual. And mark my words, the P will be in there pretty soon. Wow. The P is for pedophiles. There's a push for that. That that is a norm, a lifestyle. That push is not just for the world, but it's also for the church. And for anyone that does any counseling, that they cannot counsel one of those people to get them out of it. One of those people, yeah. One of those people that are lost and confused out of it. In fact, they're suggesting that the church and pastors and counselors accept that mm -hmm. as life. 
And so if you pe preach from the pulpit, then you will be arrested if you don't accept it. In, in any negative way, you'll be arrested. There was a pastor who went to a public library and they were having one of these events. And as he went into the library, they asked him uh, if he was a part of this event. And he says, no, I just want to go into the library. He wanted to see what was going on. He says, well, they're having a gay, lesbian, blah, blah, blah. And they said, do you accept what is taking place here? And he says, no, I definitely don't. And he says, then you need to leave. He says, well, this is a public library. Everyone has a right to come into the public library. And he said, if you don't accept this, you need to leave. And if you don't leave, we're arresting you right now on the spot. Okay. And so they arrested him. Mm -hmm. So this is happening right now. And it's like the days of Sodom and Gomorrah where they're pushing it on us. Now, I want to make this clear because I made it clear last week is, is that God is looking at sin and sin is sin and it doesn't matter what kind of sin it is. It's all sin and it will keep us separate from God. But this is, this is a sign for us of the last days, eschatology, of what is going on in our world today. And unfortunately, the Christian church has been silent on it. We haven't voiced our opinion in the voting. And we haven't voiced our opinion out there. And there are a few that are doing so. But this is what the challenges are. We're seeing this trickling down to the church where Christians are living with one another. Christians are having fornication, sleeping with one another. Uh, whether it's intercourse or whether it is touching of one another. This is all trickling down to the church. And every one of us are dealing with it. When they're saying that 50% of the church is dealing with pornography, that says a lot. Yeah. yeah. So this is happening in our world today. And Paul is dealing with these issues, and he's letting us know exactly how we ought to live as believers. He's making it very clear. So in these, chapter, in these chapters that we've been dealing with, and specifically today, we saw that Christians were bringing other Christians to lawsuits before the secular courts. And Paul said, that's not wise for you to do, because they don't know nothing about Christianity. And so it's better for us as believers to accept the wrong if our brother wrongs us and keep that relationship intact. And that's hard to do. And then he goes on in verses 9 through 11, he talks about Christians not practicing unrighteousness. That if they're going to be great judges and judging matters of the church, that they can't be living like the secular world. They need to understand spiritual things. And then these last verses here, he's talking about the temple of God and how we as the temple need to keep this temple holy and pure. So three points this morning. We're going to talk about the physical body. That is, our spirit lives in this physical body, and this physical body is deteriorating and dying, and it will be buried one day and returned to dust, but then it will resurrect in the last days and be put on a new body, and our souls will be reunited with this body. So this body is forever yes. in a different form later on. Very important, our physical body. It's very important that we treat our physical body in the right way. And thank God for the hope that is in Jesus. Amen. 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 Second point, the spiritual body. That is who we are spiritually, the soul and the spirit itself. That's who we are. That is the eternal part of us. This just houses that spirit uh, that's in this body. That is eternal. When we die today, our spirit goes to be with the Lord while our body is in the dirt until that day when the rapture comes. And then we're going to talk about the temple of God, which is the body, and how the Spirit dwells in that body. So let's read the text so we get the context. Verse 12, all things are lawful for me, Paul says, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things are brought under the power of any. Food, foods for the stomach and stomach for the food, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise up by His power. Raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who joins to the Lord is one spirit with him. Then he says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body. But he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. 
Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Let me say that one again because we forget this as believers. You are not your own. Somebody owns you. You're actually a slave to somebody. Yes. That's to Jesus Christ. Amen. But we're like slaves. Back in the days of slavery, right? They didn't like being owned. So what did they do? They ran. And they took opportunities to escape. They found ways. And of course, in, in the human sense, yes, that was the right thing to do. And they had the trains and you know, they get them to safety. But in a spiritual sense, for us to run from Christ, he's our master. It doesn't make any sense at all because all he has for us is good. But we're not our own. For you were, you were what? Brought at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Which are God's. A boy asked his grandpa, your generation didn't have to deal with sexual diseases. Why? And the old man replied, we wore wedding rings. That's why. <laughs> Funny, huh? Simple. But so accurate, isn't it? You don't have to deal with all of these sexual diseases. You don't have to deal with all of these heartaches. You don't have to deal with all these arguments and fights and murders that come from these things simply by just wearing a wedding ring and being married to one person. Pretty amazing. Now, the goddess of Venus was the principal deity of Corinth. And this is what Corinth was dealing with on a daily basis. There were about a thousand princesses in the temple there of this this goddess of Venus that was dedicated to this idol worship, to this sexual uh, um, goddess, uh, and they were public, and there were public prostitutes, these thousand, and they were there for the public and for the enjoyment of the public. If you can only imagine that, I guess if you go to Sweden, you would kind of understand a little bit of it, right? Where prostitutes are in windows, and you can walk down the street, and they're they're taken care of. It's a business, it's a job, and it's part of society, and and you can be involved with that as much as you want. This is what it was like in Corinth. They're literally a big temple with an idol, and they worship sexual immorality. And they were allowed to pay for those services. It's amazing what is being done today with those. I guess Japan uh, has something similar to that. And you're going to start seeing prostitution legalized and, and, and people able to use those services. Uh, you'll see health benefits for them, retirement, and all of these things like this. This is the way and the direction that our world is going. And we have to accept that. But we don't have to stand for it. Amen. We need Amen. to preach the gospel to the lost. Now, some in the church were finding it hard to adapt to their new Christian life. Because in their Christian life, it says, do not indulge in those things. And they were struggling with it. Why? Because they were indulging in those things. Christians in the church at Corinth were pain for these harlots to have relationships with. They were far from being secretive and even ashamed, and they were justifying their behavior. Think of the man sleeping with his stepmother in the church, and everybody knew it. And we're tolerant. We're like the culture. We're very loving. In fact, Jesus says, love one another. Isn't that the main thing? Let's just love one another no matter what. And so Paul is saying, that is so wrong. You're tolerant of the wrong things. That's why he said, I've already kicked them out. So they weren't ashamed of it. And we're getting to that point today within the church. Amen. Because people will say, yeah, we're, we're Christians and we're not married legally, but we're married under the eyes of God. I mean, did Adam and Eve go through a ceremony? And they use scripture to back up their immorality. That's so sad. These are Christians. And they're serious as I've spoken to some. Well, I, don't dis I disagree with this whole ceremonial, get a legal document. What do we need a man to say that we're married, blah, 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 blah. And they're adamant about it. We've got to stick with the Bible. Adam and Eve didn't have that, so I'm not going to have it. Well, we don't live under the Old Testament. We don't live under the Old Testament. And when you're disobedient, God will stone you, so let's do that. How about let, let's, let's keep with that too. Yeah. And we live under the New Testament, and Paul made it clear in Romans chapter 13, we follow the laws of the land. And the laws of the land says that you're to get a certificate of, of marriage. Why? So that you don't marry other. It, it leads to other things eventually. And sin has a wage. And sin always grows. And it leads to other things. So Paul is dealing with these issues. 
very clearly. So let's look at the first one, the physical body. Verses 12 through 13, Paul said, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not but will not be but I will not be brought under the power of anything. Now let's go back to verse 9 of the chap of this chapter. Verse 9 through 11 and, and remember what Paul said in verse 9, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? And he says, do not be deceived, neither fornicators nor adulterers, idolaters, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed and you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Jesus. and by his spirit of our Lord. And so we're not like that. And there are some like that. And we shouldn't be like that. Why? Because we are now sanctified by Jesus Christ. We've accepted Christ. We're now set apart and we've surrendered our life to him. And so we don't live that way anymore, Paul is saying. But yet some of them were living that way. And he's dealing with these issues right up front in verse 12, very clear. And he gives them some very insightful truths here. He starts with the with, with this conviction of not allowing anything to master over you except Christ. Now there are things that are lawful, as he says here. Let me share the Greek. All things are continually lawful or permitted for me. That's the reality. And that's true. There are a lot of things that we can do as believers. You know, I can smoke as a believer. I can smoke and still be a believer. And that's lawful for me to do. And there are Christians that smoke. But is it helpful? No. No, because we know it's been proven. that, And there's a warning on there. And, and there are people that die all the time. That it's not helpful for you. It will destroy your lungs. Mm-hmm. It will destroy your lungs. But we do it anyway. And you have that liberty to do so. So there are a lot. Of, you can drink. You can drink. As a Christian, you can drink. You can't get drunk. Mm-hmm. Be intoxicated, we saw that last week. Can't be a drunkard, but you can drink. You can have a cup of wine, you can have a beer on a hot day, you can do that. But is it helpful for you? No. No. Is it a witness? No, it's not. So all things can be lawful, but not all things can be beneficial or profitable for us. See, he goes on and says in the Greek, uh, permitted for me that's the reality, but not all things are continually profitable. This was probably a phrase that Paul had to use in teaching the Corinthian church about Christian liberties here. We could hear Paul telling the Corinthians exactly what he told the Colossians in Colossians 2, 16-17. That when it comes to what we eat or drink, or on what day we worship the Lord, all things are lawful for me. I am at liberty. And I should not let anyone put me under bondage. Mm. Isn't that interesting? And it's true. I don't have to go to church. I can worship on Wednesday night. I can worship in a fellowship on Tuesday night when we fellowship. I can worship any other night. And that's true. You can. You can. But is it beneficial? And people were using that as a liberty saying, I have liberty. You can't put me under some judgment because you worship every Sunday. And that's sad that we have to use scriptures to justify us not coming to church. <laughs> it's crazy. Mm. Instead of just saying, I love coming to church. I love coming to church. I love coming to church. I don't want anything to ever replace coming to church. I, I, love, I love teaching. I love fellowshipping. I love hearing stories. I love serving. I love everything about church. It encourages me when I come to church. When, when you get... This many spirit-filled people, the spirit is that much more stronger than sitting at home in your pajamas by yourself. (laughs) And your spirit's not very strong because it's weak. You're not even willing to get up and go to church. Mm -hmm. So you don't get a spirit-filled experience like you do here, a group of believers. How many have been to a harvest crusade? Now, when you're there, isn't it amazing? You're like, wow, it's all these believers here. And and there are a few non-believers, you know. And you're like, this is amazing. The worship starts, and you're like, man, this is like heaven. I want to die right here. (laughs) I love that. I always say that I want to die at a a conference or a Christian concert because it's like heaven there. You have all these pastors together, and they're all worshiping and singing, and they get it. They know why they're there. And they're all spirit-filled, and you just sense the spirit, and you're like, okay, Lord, take us all home. (laughs) We're ready to go. Amen. I don't get it. 
And people think, no, that's religion. You're forcing us. No, I don't want to force you. You don't have to come. You have that liberty. But I want to come. That's the yes. difference. No. See, our hearts love Jesus enough to say, I want to go to church. Amen. You know? And not look at it as though you're putting me under some sort of bondage or mastering it over me. Specifically here, from the reference to the harlot in verse 15, the point seems to be that the Corinthian Christians thought that they had the liberty to use their services of prostitution. They felt, what's wrong with that? The body has a desire and a hunger and a lust, and we're just fulfilling the body's desire. It has nothing to do with spiritually. It has to do totally physically, and so we're okay with that. And this would have been culturally accepted in the city of Corinth, and it would have been accepted in the religious community among the religious pagans who saw nothing wrong in a religious person using prostitutes. I really believe that's why homosexuality this whole agenda is being moved forward because I believe, and I can't prove this, and, and some will probably feel like I'm accusing them, but I'm not saying everyone, but I'm venturing and stay, taking a step of faith that the whole push of all this is because you have a lot of these politicians that are pushing for it is because they're also involved in that. Mm -hmm. That's right. Mm -hmm. They want that freedom and liberty to do so if they want. They want to have you call an open marriage. You know what an open marriage is? Multiple. You're married to an individual. You're married to them legally in the whole bit. But both of you are okay with you both going out and having relationships with others. Mm -hmm. As many as you want. And you're okay with it as long as you two are still married together. That's an open marriage. In the universities, it's really big in the universities. And they're teaching the kids and desensitizing them. Just hook up. You know what hookup means? Mm -hmm. That means I, my nature has a hunger, your nature has a hunger, let's just fulfill it and we'll be on our way. Mm -hmm. We're just animals. You know, you see animals on the street do this because that's what they do, animals. And, and they're doing that. There's no sense of wrong, no sense of shame, and this is what Paul was dealing with and it's entering into the church. You might have the liberty, but <clears throat> will it begin to enslave you? That's the thing. Mm -hmm. I can smoke a cigarette. But I guarantee you, after so many years, that cigarette now is your master. Because you can't quit. Try quitting. Mm. Talk to an alcoholic. I can quit any time I want to. I don't have to drink if I don't want to. The problem is he never wants to quit. Or nor does he ever try. It's only the power of Christ that delivers us, right? Yep. Only the power of Christ. Liberty must be evaluated by its effects upon our lives. So what you do and have the freedom to do, ask yourself, is it going to master over me? I remember Brian Broderson one time said years ago, I heard him on the radio and he said, I don't uh, surf as much as I did before because I found myself going to church, doing my study real fast so that I could go surfing. Mm. And all of a sudden it became a habit where I, the faster I got my study done, the more I could go out surfing. And so the priority was surfing. It was becoming a master over him. So he decided I'm not surfing anymore. Wow. Mm. So it can be anything. Mm -hmm. You know, it can be a person that, <clears throat> that has a certain persuasion. You know, maybe you're a reform. You're a reformer and you're Calvinist in a sense. And this whole doctrine of Calvinism, by the way, which the Bible doesn't speak about, um, there are truths to it, but there's a balance on both sides. But you can be so adamant about that that it has enslaved you now. Everyone else is an idiot because they don't understand your, your eliteness and understand the scriptures. Because that's ultimately what they say. Well, when you get to that point, you will understand reform theology. <laughs> it's like someone with eschatology. Same thing, eschatology, it's end times. It's all about end times. But they forget the love of God. They forget the service of God. They forget the basic fundamentals because they're into eschatology and they know everything about the end times. But it doesn't move them to serve. And it should move us to serve and do something for the glory of God. Paul said, all things are literally and continually lawful or permitted for me, but I will not be, this is how it reads in the Greek, I will not be continually mastered by anything or anyone that is lawful for me. And that's in the passive voice. I will not let anything outside of me bring me under its bondage, whether it's a person or whether it's something that I am doing. And that word master means to have power or authority, authority to be a master of anyone, exercise authority over, 
to be brought under the power of anything. You get that idea? That's what happens to the body. It becomes a slave of what you have liberty in doing. He goes on in verse 13, food for the stomach and stomach for food. But God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. So he continues with this physical need of the body. In the Greek it says food is for the stomach and stomach for the food. Now you get that, right? We need to eat. Now in Paul's times, they were eating food that was offered up to idols. And Paul is saying you have the liberty of doing that. But if it offends someone, then be careful. Do it in your own home. Don't offend others. There's where it becomes a master over you because now you start flaunting your liberties. Well, see, I got the freedom. I'm strong. And I'm, you know, and yeah, you are strong because it doesn't bother you. But your weaker brother, it bothers. And you must be concerned with him. I remember uh, years ago, I was vacuuming at a Calvary Chapel. And it was one of the uh, dirt devil vacuum cleaners, right? And this brother came in and he said, what are you doing? I go, I'm vacuuming, I'm cleaning. No, what are you doing with that vacuum cleaner? Like, I'm vacuuming. He goes, no, why that vacuum cleaner? It's a dirt devil. Why are you using a dirt devil? And he's like, I'm offended. You need to get rid of that. He goes, I don't like anything with devils on it. You know, and I'm like, wow. Now, at first I kind of like chuckled inside. Like, are you serious? But he was serious. I don't eat, was it... Uh, Deviled eggs, I don't, you know, all of those things. <laughs> so I got rid of it and got a different one because he was offended. Is he weaker? Well, of course he's the weaker brother. <clears throat> the stronger brother is able to realize that's just the vacuum cleaner. <laughs> sucking up dirt. The devil likes spewing dirt out, you know. Uh, but he was weaker, and you do that because of love. And you understand there are weaker people out there, and you're willing to give up. Uh, a little bit of what you have the liberty of doing for the sake of others. That's foreign to so many of us, isn't it? Mm -hmm. The word doing away means to render idle, unemployed, inactive, inoperative. God will do away with the stomach completely. That body will one day be in the dirt and it will be taken care of. And all of its passions, all the things that go along with it. With both of them someday, and that is the reality, that in the end, God will take care of all of that. Yet he says, yet the body is not for immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. My body wants food, so I eat. My body wants sex, so I hire a prostitute. What's the problem? That's how the Corinthians thought. God did not make our bodies that way. Sinful Adam made them that way when he gave in to the temptations of the devil. See, we see the wisdom in God's design for the body and for sexual purity when we look at the problems of unplanned pregnancies and sexually transmitted disease. Then it makes sense to us. That's a scary thought, that every time you have a relationship with the woman, you don't know how many other relationships she's had or he's had, and what diseases they have, because today you don't even have to disclose that anymore. I heard a commercial I think it was on Facebook or it might have been, yeah, it had to be on Facebook or one of those. <coughs> and they're saying now <coughs> that AIDS can't be uh, contacted through sexual relationships. And I'm like, what? So they're lying now, saying that you can't get it through sexual relationships. And then how do you get it? How do you get it? So it's just interesting how this push for sexual immorality has grown in spite of the warning signs and the things that are taking place. These are the prices we pay in the body for using our body in a way that the Lord never intended us to. The body is not for sexual immorality. You'll have a stomach and there will be food, but God will destroy that physical drive that's associated with that body. Because we're hungry at this point, right? And we go fulfill it. One day God will destroy that. We'll eat because Jesus ate, but there won't be this desire to eat. <coughs> there won't be this hunger, this lust for it. What's the body for then? The body's for the Lord. Our bodies are for the Lord. Our bodies are for the Lord. Amen. It's, they're for Him, not for ourselves. This is a contrast of our bodies are not used for fornication or any other sexual thing outside of marriage. Our bodies belong to the Lord. And today, they think <clears throat> that they can live together without being married. And they're okay. J. Vernon McGee said, uh, one couple came to me. 
wanting to talk about getting into Christian service and they weren't married, but they were living together. And I told them this was about 15 years ago and this is what was happening already in the church. They were living together and I told them, you need to go get married. And they asked, why? And I said, because God commanded it. Didn't, shouldn't that be enough for yeah. us? It no longer is enough for us. We've gotten to the point where we're like, well, I want to know why God commanded it. Not just that He commanded it. He's God. That should be enough that we should do it. But that's the way God wants it to be. And until you're willing to do that, you can't serve the Lord. Now, there are Christians who are serving the Lord that aren't married. And churches are allowing them to because they're too timid and they're tolerable to that kind of sin. We don't want to do that because it's not leading anywhere and it's only destroying the church. See, their physical bodies were not given over to sexual immorality. Their physical bodies were for the Lord, for the service of Him on this earth. The Lord was for the body to inhabit it by the Holy Spirit and to be used by God. That's what our body is for. He goes on in verse 14. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by His power. So Paul goes on to the resurrection to explain that the body will be resurrected and what we do to the body matters. So what we do to this body now in this physical realm matters in the future realm because this body will resurrect someday like Jesus resurrected. The Greek philosopher or philosophy influencing the Corinthians, Corinthians taught that the body was nothing more than a tomb or a prison for the soul. That's it. It's just, it just houses who we are. And the Greeks thought, taught that it didn't matter what you do to that body. You can indulge in anything and everything. That's what we call Gnosticism. We've heard of Gnosticism before. Uh, First John deals with that. You know what Gnosticism really is? It's a Christian who says, I don't have to live like a Christian. That's basically what it is. I'm just going to live the way I want to live. I'm not going to live like a Christian lives, or I'm not going to live the way God wants me to live. That's what Gnosticism is. I can please this body in whatever way I want to. It's the spirit that's in me and my heart that says, I believe in Jesus. He died on the cross for me. And I accept his work on the cross and I'm going to heaven. Because isn't that what the church says all the time? People get saved and say, just receive Jesus and you'll go to heaven. No, there's repentance that needs to take place there. A change of mind. And Jesus was probably the most clearest of all when he said, you must be born again in order to enter the kingdom of God. But they thought, no, it's just a body. What's wrong with that? Just fulfill the body. It's going to die anyway. And so this is why Paul says, no, it's going to resurrect too. So that's why it's important that you take care of the body. He goes on in verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make members of a harlot? And he says, certainly not. Certainly not. This is a spiritual point that I'm making here, the spiritual aspect of it. Now, that we know that the power of the resurrection and of the body is taking place, Paul makes a very clear observation here in verse 15. He says in the Greek, Do you not know continually? They had a knowledge of this. It was there, and that was the reality. They understood this. I, and I believe that Christians understand that sexual immorality is wrong. They have this knowledge of it, but they refuse to give in to it. They give right. in rather to the sin. Do you not know continually that your bodies are literally continually members of Christ? And the emphasis is on the continual. They are members of Christ. When you become a born-again believer, He's the head, you're the body. And you're attached to Him. And as I said earlier, it's almost like, I think it's cerebral palsy, right? Where you don't have uh, control of your bodily functions, right? And it's like, that's what the church is today. Christ is the head and the body is doing whatever it wants. Yeah. Now, if you were reformed, you would say, those, there's no way, because God's church is perfect. Right. right? God's church wearing a white robe, Revelation says, and they won't accept the fact that the church is, is sinful. That's reformed theology. Here's the thing. These are the Corinthians at Jesus' time, and look what they were involved in. And yet Paul never said you weren't Christians. He never condemned them to hell. 
What he's saying is you're living wrong and you need to get your lives right with the Lord. He goes on and says, and I'll read it in the Greek, shall I then take away the member of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? That's a question. No, of course, certainly not. You will not take the body and then make it a member of the... Can you imagine Christ the head of the church, the body, and then joining it with a prostitute? Mm. Wow. Now how serious is that? Now that sounds pretty serious. Can you imagine your daughter or your granddaughter being abused by a pedophile? You'd take that pretty serious. Especially when there was no desire for that. Now, a pedophile would say, yes, there is. It's mutual consent. You can't get consent from a minor. They don't know what they're doing. You would, you would probably take a Glock Mm-hmm. and find this guy or girl mm-hmm. and just get it done. Mm-hmm. That's how serious it is. And yet, we can sit there and go, here's Christ the, body, the head and we're the body and we can join it with a prostitute. We can join it with somebody that we think we're really now in love with. That needs to be taken just as serious as the other. He goes on, verse 16, or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. Now, he's using an Old Testament uh, phrase, right? Back in Genesis. Mm -hmm. When a man and a wife come together, they will become one flesh. And he's now using it in a sense that you think that you can join with a prostitute and you can become one flesh. Well, you do become one flesh. Continually with that one. The word shall become one flesh is progressive and particular in action. In other words, once you lay with that person, you're continually being one with that person. Now you can just imagine how that happens because you are exchanging bodily fluids. And now your DNA is mixed up with their DNA. And that is a part of you. When you have children, they now look like both of you. Now that's called oneness. And that continues to happen. And every time you have sexual relationships with the next and the next, you're mixing all this up. It's a debauchery of and against marriage completely in the the face of God. We don't care what you say about marriage and how we should relate in our relationships to one another. All we care about is fulfilling the desires of our flesh. And that's from the pit of hell, from Satan himself. That's what... Genesis chapter 6 was dealing with the whole way when mankind was totally obsessed with every imagination in their mind. He goes on in verse 17, but he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. The word joined there is interesting. He who is joined to the Lord. You know what that word joint means? Because we just think, you know, hey, put your arm, we're joined together. No, 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 no. That word joined means to glue. Cement. Try wearing cement boots. Put you together. What does that mean? You're never separated. You're never separated. You ever watch a a mouse pad, a cement mouse pad, or a glue mouse pad? You want to catch a mouse or a rat? They sell these little pads that are glued. You peel it. You lay it on the ground. Little guy comes along. He steps on it. Like oh no! He reaches the other. He steps. Now he's trying to. Do it, and now he's stuck. He is cemented on that thing. We have a, a, a pet lizard that lives in our front yard, alligator lizard. <clears throat> and Virginia had these little glue pads for bugs, and they're just little house, and bugs get in and they get trapped and so forth, and, and because we have a bird. And she threw this, I guess, out in the front yard for whatever reason. Well, all of a sudden I look out there, and there's our little alligator lizard, and he's stuck on it, you know? And I'm like, oh no. So he can't move, and every time he moves, he's you know his whole body is getting glued on there. So I grabbed it, and I'm trying to take one leg off and one you know tail off, and as soon as I get the tail off, you know, uh, and then grab the leg, the tail gets back on there, and, and then going around. Finally, I was able to get him off of it, but it took a while for me to cut it all up and get him get him off of this pad. 
And of course, he lost a little bit of skin <laughs> along the way because it really glued. You know, we're glued to the Lord Amen. himself. And it says continually. And that is a reality when you accept Jesus Christ. You are glued to him Amen. continually as you're walking with him. One spirit, that is how we should be walking with him. Everything we do in life along the way should be with Christ. So what does he say in verse 18? The third point, the temple of God. Flee sexual immorality. That word flee means seek safety by flight. Shun or avoid by flight. Save by, in other words, run. Stay away and don't go back. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Now we see this in the picture of Joseph. Genesis 39 on, right? Yes. Joseph all of a sudden is working, and Potiphar's wife, uh, Potiphar, yes, Potiphar's yeah. wife comes in. We can punch his pilot. Potiphar's wife comes in, and he, she wants to lay with Joseph because he's a handsome guy. God blessed him. Probably had muscles and everything. Good looking, nice hairline. You know, and she's a, a whore. Sleeping with whoever she wants. And she thought, I want this guy. He wouldn't do it. He kept fleeing and fleeing and fleeing and fleeing. Now, you get a young man like that, hormones are raging and so forth. The chances are he probably would. And she probably had a lot of them. That's why she kept doing it. But he was glued to the Lord. He was glued to yes. the Lord, and he would not do it. He fled sexual immorality. And it says continually in the Greek there. Flee it continually. That means every time there's an opportunity, you run from it. Every other sin that a man commits, uh, the word commits there means, uh, this is interesting. This is interesting. Because the Greek word there for commit is to make or produce. It's not that you're committing it. Form or fashioning is what the word means. You are formulating it in your mind. So in other words, it's not like all of a sudden you fall into it. It just happened to surprise you. This woman just threw herself at me. No, that's mm. not true. You've been watching her at the gym, and you've been formulating these thoughts and ideas and committing yourself. Where's the opportunity where she smiles at me and then I get to smile? And then things start to happen. That's what he's saying here. Every other sin that a man commits, he plans on committing, each and every time is outside of the body. But immorality, now this is interesting. It's a different word than the other words, which is just dealing with the sexual acts. This word, immorality, means to be given to idolatry. In other words, this immorality is, you are worshiping this. This has become a prostitute in a temple. That's what he's saying here. So now that becomes your God. It becomes your God. And so you live with them. <clears throat> because that's what you do with gods. You live with your God. And two Christians that are living together, they're both idolaters. Living together. They worship themselves. And that's exactly what Eve did and Adam did. They said, we don't need to worship God. We can worship ourselves. We know better than God. So Paul is saying, you need to flee that continually because it's sin against the body. Or do you not know, verse 19, that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own. So he brings back his thoughts to who we are and what we're set apart from. In the Greek it says, or do you not know continually, again, they knew without a doubt that your bodies is the temple or a shrine. That's the word. It's a shrine for the Holy Spirit that dwells within you. Continually he's in you. He doesn't leave you. The Bible says you're sealed until the day of redemption by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so he dwells in you and then you are going out with a prostitute or committing some fornication outside the body, that should not be at all. Verse 20 says, For you were bought, purchased at a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are 
God. So here's the ultimate truth. It's like, wow, this is why we don't do that. Because God purchased us. We were taken by force, by an enemy who abducted us, and God went and paid the price. Not a million, not a trillion, not a billion, but his own son. He gave his life so that we could have eternal life. Yes. And we're not serious about that. We don't want someone to say, let's go to church. Well, I don't have to go to church. Jesus bought you at a price. Amen. Why wouldn't you want to go to church? That's why he says, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. For you were bought. And the word bought there means to buy, like you're visiting a marketplace and you're literally buying. <clears throat> it's Jesus visiting the world and purchasing you into his family. That's his work. It has nothing to do with you. Let me make that clear. Just because you stay away from sexual immorality doesn't save you. Jesus alone saves you. It's yeah. yes. grace by faith that you've been saved. You don't practice sexual immorality or not involve sexual immorality in these things or adultery and so forth because you love God. That's why. And you don't want to offend Him in that relationship. Have you, You've all seen how relationships are destroyed. Marriages are destroyed when there's infidelity, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine what we're doing to God. Yeah. We're breaking that relationship. We're destroying that witness when we do these things. Say, so, look, I bought you. It was a price. And the price was fixed. <laughs> there was no negotiation. I sent my son to die on the cross for you. So all you need to do as Paul says, therefore glorify God in your body. Glorify God in your body. Let me close with this. Here's the truth, guys. The truth is, you and I have been defiled. Let's be honest, we have been defiled. <laughs> That's just a fact. Well, I, I haven't committed adultery. What you? Jesus said, if you lust in your heart, Look, we are defiled. We're humans who have sinned. Our hearts are wicked and deceitful. We formulate these thoughts, whether you're single, whether you're married and you see someone and you're already formulating, what would it be like to be married to them? Oh, why am I thinking like that? The only problem is when you're married to them, you're going to run into the same situation when you were married to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Nothing changes. We're yeah, yeah. all human, sinful beings that have the same flaws and inadequacies, and we're just trying to find who's one that's not. Well, you're not going to find it. And it's always too late by the time you realize that. See, the truth is, you and I are defiled. Well, how can I say that? Well, look into Mark 7, 20. Jesus said, what comes out of a man that defiles a man? From within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, evil eyes, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Now, you might be saying, well, I never think of those thoughts. You know, I'm 80 years old. <laughs> I remember a, a gentleman I was talking to when we were trying to purchase this building, and he was 80 years old. And I was talking to him, and he says, hey, uh, he, he was saying, I'm here in Starbucks getting a cup of coffee. And as we were talking, he goes, hang on, hang on, hang on. He goes, a beautiful woman just walked in. Wow. She is gorgeous. And then he goes, you would think at 80 years old I wouldn't care anymore. But he cared. He cared. 80 years old, and he was yet still attracted to the opposite <laughs> sex. So in our heart, Jesus made it very clear, proceeds evil thoughts of whether it's adulteries or murders or thefts. And theft can be a matter of the heart that you want to steal someone's items because they have something better than yours. Therefore, what's the solution? And this is where grace comes in, right? Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. Because he was perfect. He was not defiled. He is the one that dwells within us. 
He is perfect in every way. Amen. 2 Corinthians 5.20, be reconciled to God, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So the only reason that we're righteous is because of Jesus Christ. Amen. And we stand before him righteous. And we should stand proudly and boldly before God and say, I am a righteous believer. Though I have these evil thoughts, that is the flesh, and I rebuke it, I confess it, and I continue to walk with the Lord. That is how we walk daily. Otherwise, we would be hopeless, wouldn't we? Amen. So thanks to yeah. Jesus Christ. So the answer is keeping our eyes on Jesus. He fulfilled the law. He's the victor. Amen. He's the one that we hold on to and we're glued to. Yes. And Him alone. So thank God for that because when we sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us Amen. and wash us from all unrighteousness. He's the hope of our glory. He's the answer. He's our very life and breath, Paul would say. So we need Jesus even more than ever before. And if you don't have Jesus Christ, you need to confess Him today as your Lord and Savior. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You, Lord, for Your precious Word. And I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone out there, Lord, who does not know Jesus, who's not totally surrendered their lives, maybe they're dealing with these issues, Lord. Maybe they're a part of the scams and schemes of Satan himself, Father, and they realize today, Lord, that their life isn't right. They need to humble themselves and repent. That is, turn from that way and start walking towards God. Get back into church. Get into fellowship. Start living a righteous life as God wants us to live. Not that it saves us, Lord, but it's out of love for being Amen. saved. Amen. So, Lord, would you come into our lives? We need you, Jesus. If you haven't asked Jesus into your life, then ask him right now. Lord Jesus, come into my life. Be my God. I repent of these sins. I'm going to turn from these ways. I'm now going to start reading your Bible, start praying, get involved in church. I'm going to change my life for you, Lord. And I need your help and your filling of the Holy Spirit to give me the power to live for you, Lord. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 God bless you. Thank you for... for joining us this morning. Uh, we're going to have to end with worship because I took too long. <laughs> so, enjoy the fellowship as we meet out there and break bread together. And the Lord bless you. If you need any prayer, um, Randy will be up here. Bertha will be up here. And they love to pray with you. God bless you. Welcome to the